And today we are going to be joined by uh, Jimmy Negus, um, who is a PhD candidate at CU Boulder, um, studying active galactic nuclei, uh, or referred to as AGN, uh, with the <laughs> Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, which is uh, a telescope survey. Um, and with this survey, he can analyze the light from 10,000 galaxies to identify signatures of movement and composition in their bright centers. So, Jimmy, did you want to add anything to that or correct anything? I, I think that was a beautiful explanation. Uh, you know, I obviously think AGN are uh, the best objects in the universe. The best. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I look forward to discussing more about, um, you know, sort of our attempts to understand their nature and their impact on galactic evolution. Very cool. Well, I guess we will start things off with, a, to us, what might seem like a very simple question, but it's actually probably a, a much more substantial question than we think. And the question is, Jimmy, what is a black hole? <laughs> that is an excellent question, and it is the peak of many people's interests. Uh, they get a lot of discussion in astronomy, and it's worth just going back and discussing sort of what these cosmic objects are. And so a black hole, as many would uh, imagine, is a black hole in space. Right. <laughs> and and so to gain, some, <laughs> to gain some more context, uh, it's helpful to start with stellar evolution. And so stellar evolution is the host of many black holes, particularly when we have massive stars greater than eight solar masses that undergo nuclear synthesis and throughout their energetic lifetimes continually process and churn and create new elements through the process of fusion to counteract the force of gravity, once that fuel supply is exhausted, what you can have is a type two supernovae. And so for these events, what happens is a dense stellar core contracts once, the, once iron is fused and um, what's left for the most massive cores is what becomes a black hole. And so essentially these objects are extremely infinitely dense regions in space. And they're traced not by visual observations, but by how neighboring, it, how neighboring matter interacts with them. And most astronomers, uh, I'd say the bulk of astronomers agree that at the heart of every massive galaxy is a supermassive black hole. And so what we want to understand is really what properties of these black holes uh, influence the ultimate growth of, of galaxies. Um, but so to start, black holes, you have very dense cosmic objects that are usually from collapsed stars um, that create stellar black holes. And these black holes can grow through mergers with other black holes or through mergers with other massive compact objects. So black holes that are small can merge with other small black holes or small black holes can merge with neutron stars. They can uh, begin to siphon gas and dust from their neighboring regions. And these are some of the processes for which smaller black holes can grow into bigger black holes, which we believe are at the heart of, of most massive galaxies. So just to kind of put the yeah. picture in, in everyone's head, when I think of a black hole, I'm kind of thinking of a star, <laughs> right? This sphere in space, but yes. instead of giving off light, it's just like this completely dark object, like almost unimaginably, just like this sphere of almost nothingness. Is that the right way to kind of picture a black hole in my mind? Or how do you think about it? So for me, I actually think about it purely in terms of general relativity. <laughs> so my, one of my great analogies, so indeed, you are correct. It is a spherical object that is in space. Um, it, it was actually black holes were called dark stars before they were termed black holes. And that is because uh, we didn't really understand their properties. But for me personally, I think of it in terms of general relativity. And um, the best analogy I can think of is a trampoline. And if you have a trampoline, which is, is, is equivalent to space time in our, in our analogy here, imagine you have uh, a bowling ball at the center of that trampoline. That would be say um, the sun. You know, You have this massive object that is warping space and time and the orbit around this massive object is dictated by the curvature of that trampoline or space time. Now for black holes, imagine you had something that stretched this trampoline 
it almost ripped a hole through it. It was so dense and so massive that you stretch the trampoline beyond any comprehension. And so that's sort of what we're dealing with is we're dealing with something that is so dense that there is no recovery once you get too close. So with the bowling ball analogy, you could imagine if I had a golf ball, if I flung that golf ball fast enough, you could, you could, you could dip and then you could escape. But with a black hole, once you reach a certain region, there is no escape. And that's where the name is derived from is because there is a region where light itself cannot escape. And so what we're seeing is a literal um, a gravitational tug of war that is so strong, it's almost incomprehensible. And we're just witnessing light that can no longer overcome these forces. And that is sort of the source of, 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 of the black hole terminology. Um, and of course, you know, these objects are still an active uh, source of research that we're, we're trying to gain better understanding of. Sure. And just to make, clear things up, mm -hmm. that trampoline analogy, the rubber of the trampoline is kind of this allegory for everything, you know, the space that we live in, you know, and so Indeed. just for, you know, anyone listening that's maybe unfamiliar with general relativity, it's this idea that the entire, you know, every, all the space that, that we inhabit, including the gas and the air that we breathe, is, is actually part of this kind of fabric, is what we usually call it, called space time. And that's what's bending, you know, as, as a result mm -hmm. of the, the infinite density of this black hole. Indeed. So, uh, very cool. Well, thanks for, for that awesome description. I think I <laughs> want to understand black holes more than I did before getting on here. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Tara now to ask you some questions about your research. Of course. Yeah. Um, I liked what you said earlier, and I love how you put it on your website. I love the sentence that you wrote out that says, at the core of each galaxy, there exists a supermassive black hole, a dense cosmic region with a mass equivalence of up to a billion solar masses. That's just so pathetic. <laughs> I like how you put that. But just to clarify, so do most scientists now think that every galaxy has a black hole at the center? Every massive galaxy. So yeah. the exception, of course, you have dwarf galaxies or irregular galaxies. Uh, so you can think of objects like the small Magellanic clouds, the large Magellanic clouds. For objects like those, it has not been confirmed that at the center of all of those entities, uh, there exists a black hole. But what has shown in the literature with very, very strong consistency and evidence is that supermassive black holes do occupy these inner regions. And, you know, of course, it's astronomy, so we can only provide um, the strongest consensus. Um, it's, it's always, it's a scientific process, so it's, it's always under constant review and evaluation. And so that's why we, you know, nothing is 100% definitive, but we strongly believe that this is the case um, for our, our massive galaxies in our universe. Okay. Cool. I love, I like that because, you know, it's one of my favorite things to tell people is that black holes are not like this rare exotic thing. <laughs> They're kind of everywhere. There are many to believe, to be um, believed to exist in our, in our own galaxy, um, just at a much smaller uh, scale than the supermassive ones. And when I say supermassive, what I mean is by um, a million or more solar masses, the equivalence of, of a black hole's mass. That once you reach that threshold, you are then considered supermassive. Okay, cool. So, do you have like that's one of my favorites? But do you have a favorite sort of black hole misconception or things that people think they know about black holes but isn't quite right? Of course, of course. So the classic the classic example is if I were to replace the sun, our sun, with a black hole that was the same mass, what would happen? And you know, most, most students are, the entire solar system would be consumed and we would go funneling in and become spaghettified. But of course, um, a black hole is, is it's just merely concentrated matter. So if I had a black hole that was the exact same mass as the sun, despite being uh, significantly smaller, we would notice no change at all, other than uh, no sunlight. <laughs> So that's one of the, I think the biggest misconceptions is that once you are a black hole, you um, are this, this, this massive entity that's going to consume everything around you. It's purely a function of the mass, which determines the gravitational force. Um, and just to follow up, another one is that um, black holes are 
huge um, in terms of volume um, relative to the size of a galaxy, where it in fact turns out that they are very, very small compared um, to the overall size of a galaxy. And in fact, some of the most massive, supermassive black holes are only on the order of hundreds of astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun. So you can imagine um, it's, it's a very small, compared to a galaxy that's 150,000 light years across, um, that a black hole is really only a tiny fraction of that volume uh, within a galaxy. So those are the two biggest misconceptions that are very uh, fair. And um, you know, I had those exact same misconceptions um, on my journey to becoming a researcher. Yeah, those are definitely ones that, I, at least here in the planetarium, we get questions like that all the time, <laughs> especially from little kids. They think that, you of know, course. a black hole is going to form and suck us all in. And <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So let's, bringing it a little closer to your research, you specifically look at active galactic nuclei, the center of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So how is an AGN different than a black hole specifically? Indeed, indeed. So um, an AGN is where things, it's, it's no holds barred. It's, it's where things get very interesting. And what we have is usually most galaxies host quiescent or quiet black holes. So they exist at the center of these galaxies and matter, uh, you know, tends to orbit around them, but they don't cause too many problems. <laughs> However, if you have perturbations or disturbances or or things become uncomfortable for that black hole. So you can think if, if say a merger is underway, or if you have uh, collisions of, of massive compact objects, if you have turbulent events, what can happen is this supermassive black hole can begin to accrete matter violently around this black hole. And for about 10% of the cases, we believe that very powerful electromagnetic radio jets can stream from the, um, the axis perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. And so what we're seeing in these active galactic nuclei is essentially particles that follow strong magnetic field lines. But to answer your question directly, an active galactic nuclei is when active accretion, which is just the rapid funneling and spilling of matter directly um, onto the uh, sphere of that black hole, once that begins, we consider that galaxy active. And for reference, our own black hole, Sagittarius A star, um, is a quiescent galaxy. So we believe that it is not active, but it's not to say that it cannot become active or that it was active at some point in its lifetime. Okay. So, and that's another question that I get all the time with, you know, we hear about these bursts and these radio jets and mm -hmm. things. If these black holes are so dense and have so much gravity that like not even light can escape this, how is this huge mm -hmm. jet of radio <laughs> coming out of it? Of course, of course. So we have entirely different processes at, at effect. And so the gravitational force is actually one of the weakest forces in our universe. And what is stronger than that are electromagnetic forces. And so what happens is you're, you're having particles, dust, gas, you have stars, uh, baryonic matter that is, is funneling around this black hole, but these are all electrically charged particles and, and states of matter. And what happens is when you rotate these electrically charged particles, you create magnetic field lines perpendicular. And this, is actually much stronger than the gravitational force that's trying to pull the matter in. And so what you're having is, 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 is an interplay between uh, this matter and the magnetic field lines that's overcoming the force of gravity. And these are actually some of the most powerful signatures of the universe that are usually observed in X-ray and have velocities that can approach uh, fractions of the speed of light. So these are very, very energetic and powerful um, radiation that we're, that we're observing. Can I ask really quick description. with a question that just came to my head when you said that? It, so I don't want to say, I guess my question is with, with the vast mm -hmm. strength of the electromagnetic force compared to gravity, are you, is it possible 
that you could take something inside of a black hole, inside of the event horizon, you know, that boundary of a black hole and move it out of the black hole with electromagnetic force? Unfortunately not. Okay, all right. <laughs> so the event horizon truly marks the point where our hands are, we have no chance of recovering information um, through classical means. And, and once it, it's reached that point, uh, information is said to be lost forever, um, though there are other regimes that um, uh, the information paradox that hopefully we'll discuss later. There are other methods that we can try to account for the information that's lost, but um, well agreed upon is that once you cross that event horizon, uh, you are in the abyss. <laughs> Like the point of no return. The, the point of no return, unfortunately. It's a dark place <laughs> that I, I don't think any of us would want to venture into. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can send a probe, uh, you know, in a thousand years, we'll have the technology uh, to get close enough to a black hole. But for now, <laughs> we're not there. Yeah, but for now, we can study these, the spectra, the light mm -hmm. and the energy that's, you know, around that black hole and coming out of the AGNs, which is what you do. You look at the, the light that's, that's reflecting off of there or being emitted mm -hmm. out of there. Um, so what kind of things can we learn from the spectra of these AGNs? Indeed, indeed. So spectroscopy is an astronomer's best friend. Uh, you know, unlike many uh, sciences, physical sciences, um, on Earth, you know, we can't just go to a laboratory and measure <laughs> measure properties we want. So we have to rely upon our observations. And of course, these objects are extremely far, and we can't just send a probe to a black hole. So our best friend is how can we analyze the light that is emanating or produced by these objects? And through spectroscopy, we can attempt to gain some understanding about the fundamental physics of what we're seeing. And in particular, AGN are known for the extremely fast cloud velocities that orbit their black holes. And so the first sort of telltale sign that you're viewing an AGN, particularly if you're looking at it pole on, is we'll notice very, very broad emission lines. And broad emission lines correspond to the velocity of the matter that's orbiting these black holes or that's being ejected from these black holes. So one of our best friends is, is studying a lot of the spectral lines. And for my project in particular, I'm looking at the ionization states. So when an atom becomes ionized, we're effectively stripping an electron. And to, in order to strip electrons from certain species of matter, it requires abundant supplies of energy. And we believe that there are certain highly ionized species that unambiguously correspond to active galactic nuclei. And so my project is, can we hunt down these ionized gas signatures so that we can better find these AGN? And that is the true challenge is finding the AGN because we would love to study them. We, we would love to learn their properties, but we're learning that it's hard to, um, hard to find these AGN. You know, in some cases, there's not enough light that's being emitted for us to detect. And so similar to, to black holes that are quiet, we try to infer the presence based on the response of the matter around it. And so my project is really getting at the heart of understanding the behavior of the matter that AGN are interacting with. So even though these things are, you know, super active and bright and fast and yeah. everything, they're still difficult to find. So a, a caveat here is they're very bright and they're very um, active, but what we have is other processes that can mimic AGN. Uh -huh. So they're very bright, but imagine if you had an AGN that is millions of light years away and... Um, let's say you had a supernova, you know? So um, what happens is you can have supernova remnants that mimic these AGN signatures because they're also very bright, powerful events. And given the distance, sometimes it's hard to infer which one is which. And most of our um, advances in the field of AGN study rely upon the ratios of prominent emission lines to determine this, uh, if it's an AGN or not. 
And this is due to the energies, like I said, that are required to produce certain lines. The problem with that is, again, you can have star formation contaminate a lot of these ionization ratios. Because fast outflowing energetic processes tend to mimic each other. And so it can be very challenging. And, and this was actually the foundation. So AGN are called quasars, which the root of that is quasi stellar object. And that was because we didn't know if they were just very bright stars or if they were actually uh, what we know today is active galaxies. So it's, it's a very challenging field, but spectroscopy is, is, is an astronomer's most valuable asset in terms of peering through the night and, and really resolving uh, some of the mysteries of the universe. Yeah, it's, it's definitely my favorite thing <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, just it's, I think it's crazy that just by seeing the different ways that light can be emitted from something, you know, hundreds of mm -hmm. millions of light years away, like you can look at it and tell if that's grass or astroturf, you know? <laughs> it's it's really crazy. Cool. It's crazy. Um, it really is fascinating. Yeah. And I love that this seems like it's a really fast evolving field like so much has changed in our knowledge and our ability to study black holes and AGNs recently mm -hmm. um where do you think or maybe hope <laughs> that AGN research is heading what do you think we're going to get to in the near future so the key is resolution it's all about spatial resolution just like if you're in your backyard and you know, you're, you're using a camera, you know, your phone camera is going to be a lot different than a professional grade SLR. And the amount of detail at great distances is going to change based on, on how well you can um, differentiate what's happening across a field of view. And so what my project does is it leverages Sloan, but it's actually a sub catalog of Sloan. And it utilizes what's known as the mapping uh, galaxies at Apache Point Observatory catalog also known as manga, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Asian uh, cartoon as well, but for our, for our case, it's, uh, it's uh, an observational catalog. And the beauty of this catalog is what I can do now for the first time with Sloan is to get a spatially resolved spectrum across a half an arc second for every part of a galaxy. So I can get a full, characterization of how the galaxy is evolving and behaving with extreme resolution. And this is gonna allow us to, to really trace how outflows, um, how the accretion disks, how all of these are impacting things like star formation. So what we wanna know and what an active question is, is how can AGN influence star formation? And there are a lot of opposing theories. One theory suggests that AGN halts star formation. So in order to form stars, you have these huge molecular clouds that require density and they need to be cool enough to actually coalesce and form stars. So one theory is you have these powerful AGNs, they disrupt the peaceful birth of new, new stars that enrich our universe. Um, but another theory um, actually suggests that some of these outflows can create the dense pockets needed along the edges of the outflows. And so in this case, you would actually have AGN promoting star formation. And this is still a very, very uncertain, um, inconclusive realm of astrophysics, is understanding the basic nature of how an AGN influences, influences the ultimate growth of the galaxy, which has um, huge implications um, for, for other processes, even life, you know, in order for life to form, you would want an abundant supply of star formation um, to, to enhance your odds of, of having a habitable solar system. So this really trickles down to many areas of, of the physical sciences. That is very cool. I love it. It keeps me up at night, but I, I enjoy it <laughs> thoroughly. The best questions do. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm going to pass it back over to Colin. He's going to okay. ask you some more, uh, not personal, but just more questions about you as a scientist. Of course. 
Of course. <laughs> really quick, I just want to kind of, I, I want to return to something that you said that kind of is mind boggling. You said that right now, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that you kind of have the power to resolve differences that are one half of an arc second uh, in, in the sky. Is that correct mm -hmm. with, with your Indeed. current technology? Indeed. Um, I encourage our listeners to look up integral field spectroscopy. It is a revolutionary tool that gives clarity that has never before been seen in astronomy. And just to make this clear, kind of how amazing that is, an arc second is just kind of a measure of how big something appears in our sky, right? And so, you know, in, we, we can divide the sky into 180 degrees, right? Half of a circle. Then you can divide one of those little wedges, one degree into an arc, 60 arc minutes, and then you can divide one of those arc minutes into 60 <laughs> arc seconds, which is one 3,600th of a degree, which is one 180th of our sky in terms of how big something appears to be. So what you're saying is that you can, you can you know, tell the difference between two things that are, what would that be? Uh, it would be like, what is 3,600 3, times two? 36 times two, that's like seven, one in 7,200 parts difference in the width of our sky. Is that from horizon to horizon? Is, am I understanding that correctly? That, that's correct, half an arc second. It is, it is really insane. How um, small that is. Indeed, indeed. And, and it, 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 it's, looking at the results has been fascinating so far. I'm at the, um, entering my fourth year of research and, and it, it has been truly a pleasure to see some of these results and um, it's, it's fascinating. So traditionally spectroscopy of galaxies, we use a two dimensional slit that goes along uh, a single slice of the galaxy. So traditionally we have been limited to a very narrow cut of a galaxy or we've had maybe one fiber, but now we can have the resolution you're discussing across every single spaxel or pixel spatial pixel of a galaxy and that is profound that is truly profound yeah that's pretty great sorry i didn't mean to throw it <laughs> on like this discussion of no no <laughs> so so yeah as tara said i'm gonna kind of we're gonna i like to always go back in in you know it's fun to kind yeah. of learn about the the backstories and kind of your personal story how did you get to where you are working on all this cool stuff <laughs> so that's my question for you did you always want okay. to study agns or black holes or astronomy in general or you yeah know, so, you mm -hmm. discovered about yourself indeed so um I, this truly started in in um 11th grade for me where i built my first dobsonian telescope and you know i really just knew i had a broad interest in astronomy i wanted to study the stars i wanted to learn more about our origins and and the greater context for how our universe um, is, is woven together. You know, what are the fundamental laws um, dictating it? Um, I wanted to see what the true extent of our backyard was. And this motivated me through college to study physics. I knew I had to get the fundamental understanding of the physics and math. And a lot of students I have, you know, they, they get into astronomy and they just want to see pretty pictures. And that certainly is a part of it. But the fundamental underpinning of that is understanding the, the physics and the math. And so I went to University of Chicago and I got my degree in physics um, with a specialization in astrophysics. And my interests were still pretty broad. Um, and I actually, after undergrad, took a few years off. And I, I studied, um, actually assumed a position doing engineering um, at a company in Boulder, Colorado, uh, working with atmosphere, atmospheric profiling, right? It's, it's you know, it, it's, it's small scale astronomy. It's... <laughs> It's um, very local, um, but I knew after a few years that my true interest was returning to the cosmos. And in particular, a thing that fascinated me was high energy astrophysics. And the root of this interest is the influence. High energy astrophysics can literally change the, the, the very basis of a galaxy. It can, it can alter its very evolution. And so everything that stems from that evolution from planetary science to astrochemistry to astrobiology are all to me symptoms of the high energy processes that determine the structures and their behavior. And so to, to, to get to the root of high energy processes, 
what better than AGN? You know, these are some of the most powerful objects, some of the most distant objects um, that power um, a lot of the galaxies that we observe. And so for me, it was really just wanting to understand more of that. And the process was um, working closely with my advisor and discovering I really loved observational astronomy. I really loved not only understanding the physics, but seeing, seeing you know, the objects that uh, were compelling me so. And so really uh, observational astronomy and AGN sort of found me. And um, you know, as I understand more and more about AGN, uh, the more I learn about uh, you know, everything about astronomy and astrophysics, it really has a huge expansive trickle down effect. Um, and it's been a pleasure to see how it connects and how that web uh, really um, links to other, other events uh, in the universe. So when you go to grad school, you mm -hmm. know, there's kind of this process. It sounds like a lot of how you got to where you were today involved kind of this exploration, like you talking with your advisor and figuring out, okay, well, these things interest me very much. These things are little, maybe not this much. Could you quickly overview for yeah. us kind of how does grad school work? Did you go in and say, I want to do this? Um, or were you assigned to certain research at first and then Indeed. you kind of moved from there? So I'm not sure I'm your typical grad student. Uh, for me, it was very important that I connected with someone that shared my interests and also gave me the autonomy to explore what I found interesting. And so for me, I actually interviewed uh, 10 or 11 professors. And it's really the student's discretion uh, up to the student, you know, who they find interest in and talking to that person and seeing if there's a position available and then seeing if that research is in line with something you would like to do. And so when I came in, I was actually, I wanna do just theory. I wanna do theory, theory, theory. You know, it's a lot of math, a lot of computation, very nitty gritty. And uh, my advisor, you know, she, she was actually on board with that. But as that first project evolved after my first year, I determined that I, I, I just wanted to work more with data. I wanted to see more. And, and we actually, you know, that first year, after that first year, we actually changed my direction. And so it's a very fluid process that happens in grad school. And it's very much uh, the responsibility of the student to sort of cater their own destiny in a sense and to pursue your own interests. And I think that's where the best work gets done is when you're not just drudging along on a topic that is only marginally interesting, but something you're truly staked and invested in um, that will really keep you going during those long hours and those sleepless nights. <laughs> So it sounds like there's kind of a nice contrast between what a lot of students do up through the end of their undergraduate experience, which is they're kind of, you know, with, with some wriggle room, they're kind of told, here is what you're going to do next, right? You get to decide what you're majoring in, but then your college says, all right, well, here's your major, here's your, <laughs> your courses that you have to take, here's your path. And it sounds like once you get to grad school, that, you know, kind of opens yeah. up in a sense. And you Indeed. Really get to decide, which is really, that's very cool. Yeah. Thank you for that's sharing. awesome. It's awesome. And even your, you know, your advisor can send you to certain conferences that might help you. You can build certain skills, um, you know, that might be more relevant. Um, it, there's no well-defined single track. It's very much an open system sure. uh, where you have that uh, autonomy. Right. So I guess my, my final kind of personal question for you yeah. is, what do you want to do when you finish your PhD? Do you have a plan, you know, out of that? <laughs> Well, okay, so there's, there's the stretch goal, and that is uh, becoming an astronaut. So I, I have submitted two applications, and uh, you know, given the advances uh, with our space technology, um, SpaceX you know, just launched uh, this past Saturday, uh, the first crewed mission from American soil, and that was very encouraging to see. So I would love to venture into space, and I think with the commercial partners that are on board, there's more opportunities to do so. Um, sort of my second and tertiary goals would be working for NASA or uh, an observatory. I, like I said, the observation um, and really feeling connected with space is something that is, is a huge source of inspiration. And so with NASA, uh, that direct partnership, working with things that are going to space, uh, very actively engaging in research, that's going to be, you know, realized in my lifetime, <laughs> that sort of uh, is very optimistic. 
and an observatory, I just, you know, I, I can stargaze for the rest of my life and be happy. <laughs> so uh, those are, those are goals. I mean, I would love to teach um, if an opportunity arises, um, but it's, it's sort of all open. As long as I'm studying astronomy, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> That is wonderful. Absolutely. Thanks very much for sharing that part of your, you know, your of passion course. with us. Of course. Yeah. So now we're going to transition into our questions from the public <laughs> segment. We're calling this Capcom. People are okay. reaching out to us and we're uh, relaying their messages to our expert. <laughs> so we've got some <laughs> questions from the public that we're going to throw at you, see what you think. So the first one is from Mick in Boulder. He wants to know, what's the tiniest black hole we know of and do we still <laughs> have micro black holes exist? All right, so uh, the tiniest black hole is on the order of a few solar masses. And so these are um, black holes that can arise from the stellar evolution process. Um, so they are very tiny, um, but they're nothing compared to micro black holes which are still, from what I understand, theoretical objects. And so I'm not sure if many of you are familiar, but CERN, there were concerns about, you know, are they gonna create a black hole and destroy the earth? <laughs> and so let's think about the most famous equation, E equals MC squared. And so if we're talking about um, a black hole, we're talking about a dense concentration of mass, which is equivalent to a high abundance of energy. So mass and energy are essentially equivalent. And so you could consider if we had a very energetic process, such as two particles smashing into each other, could we create a micro black hole? And the theoretical minimum uh, size of such a black hole is known as the um, uh, sort of the Planck mass would be the mass of such an object. And that's about the mass of a flea egg for reference. And these are purely theoretical, and it has long been suspected that we don't even have the energy capabilities to create such an object. And if through some crazy act we did, it would survive for 10 to the negative 24 of a second. So it would be extremely, it would evaporate instantaneously in essence, because its mass is so small um, and it could not sustain itself. So it would essentially evaporate almost immediately. So that actually, going back. Oh, oh sorry, Tara, go ahead. What I was gonna say, um, and kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, black holes are not like these infinitely sucking things. There's only so yeah. much that it can do. And if it's the exactly. egg size, we're probably not in any danger. Exactly. So we're safe for now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. For now. <laughs> for uh, now. <laughs> I mean, your response to that question actually leads perfectly into our next question, which comes from Vince in New York State. Vince asks, you know, all I know about Hawking radiation is that it makes <laughs> black holes evaporate. Uh, and so the first question is, if nothing can escape through a black hole, then how can they evaporate? If that, if that information is destroyed, then, you know, how, yep. how can it kind of come back in that way? And second of all, uh, if they can evaporate, uh, and if the black hole we saw recently, <laughs> M87, um, is, is 53 million light years away, is it possible that it's gone by now at its point in space? Because what we're seeing is, is yeah. 53 million years old. Excellent. These are great questions. And so Hawking uh, was a great scientist who studied black holes, and he evoked the theory of Hawking radiation. And so essentially, there is a quantum law, a quantum law called quantum unitarity. And essentially what that means, uh, what the law dictates is that no information in the universe can just be lost. It must be accounted for or traced in some form. So as we're all familiar with, energy is conserved. So if something disappears, the, the logic is that energy is somehow just transmuted to assume a different state. And so that is sort of the fundamental backdrop for Hawking radiation. And so Hawking radiation to resolve the uh, information that is lost in a black hole posits that as a particle enters a black hole and is lost forever, to preserve the signature of that particle, there is an antiparticle that is emitted 
in an opposite direction. So one goes in and is lost, one comes out, an antiparticle. And the theory is that Hawking radiation is, it accounts for this radiation that to an observer would seem to be lost from a black hole. And over long enough time scales, the, the equation suggests that, the, that a black hole can actually evaporate over long enough time scales. However, um, the theory also suggests that the order is longer than the time of the universe for a, black, a typical black hole to evaporate. So again, um, we're talking about billions and billions and billions of years um, to theoretically evaporate any sort of uh, moderate or massive black hole. So uh, yeah, no, it's very, it, it's very certain that that black hole did not evaporate um, on the time scales. What is far more likely would be say a merger or if the AGN uh, turned off or turned on, these are much more reasonable on, on our cosmological timelines. So when we talk about the little micro black holes that we were discussing from that first question, you mentioned that, you know, it would almost yeah. instantaneously evaporate. Yeah. Is that through the same process of Hawking radiation or is that something else going on there? So my understanding is those are just inherently unstable processes. It's, it's not massive enough to really sustain itself in the first place. So um, I'm not an expert on, on micro black holes. I study the big guys, uh, but my, my theory is that they are two disconnected processes uh, and it's more of a stability issue because um, we're creating energy um, uh, almost instantaneously um, and that black hole just cannot sustain itself long enough. Got it, thank you. No problem. <laughs> and so I think we talked about this next one a little bit, but I'll throw it out there again because Ray and Austin wants to know about the distortion of space time and how does that affect the motion of other kind of cosmic bodies moving around the vicinity of like you mentioned this of trampoline course. with the huge the huge dip in it do we do we directly see that sort of motion happening indeed indeed and it's most traceable by simply looking at light so light is obviously you know it's how astronomers view the universe and so what we've noticed is through gravitational lensing if we have distant stars and galaxies that are emitting light and there's a black hole in between us and those sources, we'll notice that the light itself becomes distorted. And that is a, is a, a property of the black hole. Its gravitational influence is literally bending that light. And in similar processes through gravitational effects, uh, you obviously have stars that are tidally disrupted and rupture and fantastic explosions as, um, as the star, as part of the star is, is, is pulled towards the black hole, it becomes uh, shredded in a sense. And so you can have funnels of matter um, that are also, um, that also result from black holes pulling on neighboring matter. So these are very, very uh, intriguing objects, you know, very intriguing objects. And, and that is in fact, how we know they exist is, is through their distortion and their effect on matter. That is, that is how we, um, we infer that they, they are our companions you know, in the universe. Let me throw out another question just for me. Tara in Boulder wants to know. All right. <laughs> do, we know that pretty much everything in the universe is moving in some way. Galaxies Indeed. are moving and you know, everything is rotating. And from my little planetary scale mind, mm -hmm. um, do black holes move around a lot aside from just like the motion of the yeah. galaxy itself are they kind of gravitationally yeah. stuck within the middle of the galaxy or do they just kind of <laughs> wander so, the galaxy with them i guess so sort of from a, a very broad perspective you have cosmological expansion so our studies um which were rooted in hubble uh back in the 1930s showed that the universe is ever expanding. And so galaxies and the inherent, uh, and the black holes are inherently uh, moving along that sort of expanded motion. But as you get closer into the black hole, um, what we've noticed is that black holes can also assume angular momentum. And so this is one of the three fundamental properties of a black hole. And it's called the no hair theorem. So the theorem dictates, right, no hair, it means, uh, we, can only, uh, we can only understand three properties from a black hole, the charge, uh, the angular momentum, and the mass. 
And so one of those is the angular momentum. And indeed, uh, we can study how these black holes are moving in space. And um, that is another thing that our, our observations and our theory are, are working tirelessly to constrain uh, the specific motion. But the answer is yes, we can actually study how they rotate, uh, which is very cool and uh, fascinating. That is super cool. Nothing in the universe is static, unfortunately. <laughs> it's all evolving, changing. Easy. It's always dying and, and being birthed. Uh, it's, it's, it's our signature of the universe. But, you know, keeps yeah. us employed. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we have uh, one more question from Callie in Texas, who, which I think we kind of already answered this question. The question is, have we manufactured a black hole? And it sounds like that if that were to happen, would happen at CERN, but so far has not. Is that right? <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. Um, you would need very, very strong energies. And unfortunately, we just don't uh, have that yet. And in fact, I read a paper that um, one theorized you would need uh, an accelerator that would need to be over a thousand light years long to get a particle accelerated enough uh, to actually collide uh, with enough energy to form a micro black hole. Um, wow. So, so we're still far away and I'm not sure we would want to experiment too much on, <laughs> on uh, creating these types of energies on earth. Um, but, you know, the theory will always, you know, wonder and, and, and try to resolve these questions. Yeah. Uh, really quick, we mentioned yeah. CERN a couple of times. I don't know that we ever said yep. what CERN was. Can you tell us really quick just what we're talking about when we say yep. that word? Of course. So CERN is um, it's a particle accelerator, uh, and it's in Switzerland. And essentially, the goal of CERN is to accelerate particles and induce these highly energetic collisions uh, when particles collide. And we're trying to study the, um, the byproducts of these collisions. And we're trying to resolve um, various properties such as quarks and bosons. And we want to understand the subatomic fundamental physics that glues together uh, the very uh, atoms and, and molecules um, that are in our universe. And so it's, it's, you need energy in order to, to you know, just like cooking, you can, to cook a steak, you need some, you need some energy, you need some, some uh, dynamical situation, you know, you need combustion, and, and that's the same uh, principle uh, of CERN. Very cool, thank you. Yep. Okay, so is there anything, that, that was all of our questions that we had mm -hmm. on here, is there anything that you particularly want to, to discuss or bring up or anything we didn't ask that you wish we would have asked or anything like that? Uh, I would just say, um, you know, um, the universe is a very dynamic place and, and we as astronomers, uh, part of what keeps us going is our curiosity. Uh, we're one of the fields that readily states our ignorance, you know, dark matter, dark energy, black holes. These are huge, huge undertakings that we have uh, huge voids of knowledge on. And, you know, our goal is not to profess our expertise, it's to um, share this curiosity and to inspire each other to take part. You know, we alone do not control the skies. It is, it is all of ours. And it's something that is worth exploring and understanding and just looking up and just being awed by its wonder. You know, that is something that can be shared by all of us. And uh, especially during these times, I think it's important that we gain perspective and um, you know, unite you know, as a species. So uh, anything I can do to help, uh, you know, I'll do that. Fabulous, I love it. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Jimmy. Again, Jimmy Negus, our grad student from CU Boulder. Awesome to have you on the show. And uh, if anybody has any other black hole questions that get submitted, we might contact you a little bit later and see if we can get an email response. Otherwise, yeah, thanks again for coming in and chatting with us. It was really fun. It's been a pleasure to, to be, a bo be on board. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, All Jimmy. Right. All right. See you all. Bye-bye.